sharing what makes us laugh is a bonding thing. And I think if you're talking about um, uh, business, business thrives on cooperation, on people all pulling together. Uh, that's a great, you know, corporate glue that you can find if you can all, you know, share a sense of humor and find a way of um, uh, putting aside your differences with a, a good joke and, and having a good laugh at the people over there who are your competitors. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is the multi-award winning witty writer and creative mind behind a quality collection of comedic works. As the former lead writer for shows like Spitting Image and Have I Got News For You, he established himself as a light-hearted leader of laugh-filled television. His books are comedy treasures that utilise laughter and satire to get his point across. They have reached the bestseller list time and time again and have been translated into over 25 languages. In addition to his impressive career as a screenwriter and novelist, he broke onto Broadway as the co-writer of the massively popular musical Something Rotten. He continues to make mirthful musicals with his most recent work, Mrs Doubtfire, which hit the Broadway stage in December of 2021. Few writers can boast such broad success, from the screen to the page to the stage. John O'Farrell, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. I've been a fan for many, many years. Um, you grew up in Maidenhead, where many years later you went on to challenge a certain Theresa May to become the Member of Parliament. Was the young John O'Farrell funny and was humour valued in your family? Uh, yes, I think I would say that uh, we came from a home where there was a lot of laughter. Both my parents had great uh, senses of humour and uh, my uh, dad had that sort of uh, Irish storytelling uh, skill that he said he'd inherited from his mother. Now, I do remember when I made him laugh as a teenager, he said, I can't wait to see your jokes on television, John. And I remember thinking then that was the most flattering and sort of impossible idea. But he bought me a book saying writing for the BBC and left it by my bed very quietly. And I read it, you know, uh, very enthusiastically. But still never thought that was something that was possible for me. But that said, you know, we laughed a lot and we watched a lot of comedy as well. So it was something we did together was watch all the sitcoms and talk about them. So they were they were supportive. And, and so there wasn't a case of like when you did become a comedy writer, they were going, when are you going to get a proper job? No, I mean, there was a there was a period after university, quite a long one, really, uh, three or four years when I was um, drifting and had no purpose and was doing building jobs or driving jobs. And they never gave me a hard time about, you know, training to become an accountant or going to do a law conversion degree or anything. I was trying to get bits of writing away and sending off things without very much idea about how to do it. But no, they were very supportive in that time. And uh, I think new that I had aspirations to work in comedy or TV or something and uh, never gave me a hard time and then became very thrilled when I started to have some success at it. Do you still ha I hanker for performance? I mean, I know you get some of it out with your brilliant podcast, but, but do you still hanker for it? Is there still that bit inside you going, I really want to perform? Not really, to be honest. I... Um, there was a time when uh, my books first came out and I had a column in The Guardian, say the, the, the turn of the century, really, when I was sort of, uh, the phone went a lot for these things. And I said yes, generally, because I felt, A, it was good to 
it sold books when I was on the telly and it got the uh, the brand across as it was. My publicist was very happy with me at my publishers. And I also enjoyed it. I enjoyed going up and doing speeches at Labour Party conference or, you know, after dinner talks for charities and stuff. That was nice. But I'm not sitting there going, oh, I wish I was on QI. I just, I just don't think I'd be as good as Stephen Fry or Alan Davis or, you know, um, all the people are on would I lie to you? They're so funny. <laughs> and I think I'd be a C plus compared to their, their A plus. So I'm realistic about how good I am at those things, which I think is probably quite important. Well, I, I think, yeah, it's actually understanding uh, how far you can go. I do think that, that you are brilliant with Angela Barnes on We Are History podcast. I think that that's really good because it's a very light sort of uh, look at, at history. And I was recently listening to the Robert Maxwell one and it j- just draws you in. So oh, that's I mean, good. No, that's very I nice just... of you to say so. It's a, it's a very uh, easy, relaxed, as you say, format. We're not aiming to be BBC One at prime time. So perhaps the uh, expectation is not as high. Uh, and we actually, we've done some work and we're communicating some information that we've researched. So that sort of justifies us being in front of the microphone um but so yeah i enjoy doing that with angela but that said it's that's i see that as a bit of a hobby rather than a career move if you know what i mean and my my core work is being at my laptop writing scripts books um screenplays novels uh, librettos for musicals yeah so but they all have one thing in common which is humor runs through them all uh yeah. thing. how important do you think that it is to have humor at the core of what you do and why do you think that that, that everything is revolving around humor for you well i uh it's it's what i am good at i suppose uh i look at some people who can draw and i think well that's a magic trick that you've got there that you can look at that bowl of fruit and you know get the dimensions of it and recreate that on paper that for me is an impossibility what i tend to look at things and um see the humor in them and people have said to me in the past oh i I love the serious bits in your books you should write a serious book and i'm going oh why why would you want me to write a serious book? I've got this, I'm not going to write beautifully crafted, um, you know, literary sentences. I know how to structure a joke. I know how to tell a funny story and to um, examine things that I think are ludicrous or bizarre or just funny. And that's my thing. And uh, so I don't say, I don't think everything is funny. I just think that's the way I like to approach things. And that's the skill and experience i've got i suppose uh, you know limited as that is um so uh, that's 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 just the way i like to proceed and i enjoy making people laugh i have to say i look at people who have really tough jobs um you know dealing with tragic situations i think how lucky am i i'm surrounded by people laughing in my work that's a that's a great privilege for me well, well, yeah, and you've well, you've done it at the top for for so many years, and I'd like to take you back to because you did ten series of Spitting Image, and yes, we indeed. recently uh, interviewed John Lloyd, um, wow. uh, your producer. Uh, when you were doing that, it had seemed to have real cut through, and the comedy really seemed to cut through to the psyche of the country. Do you think that? relevance in politics uh, has diminished in some way and therefore it's harder to do satire like you did in those days i certainly think it's harder to do a show like that today first of all back in the 80s uh, when spittish came along spitting image came along there were four channels and uh, spitting image was uh, viewed by millions and millions of people. It was it was must-see television on a Sunday night on ITV. You know, now the uh, audience is scattered much more widely across hundreds of channels, so you don't get that shared national experience that you had back then. The other thing I would say about that time was that, believe it or not, our politicians still were held with a certain amount of reverence and our royal family uh, were held with a certain amount of reverence and there was a pedestal to pull them down from. Uh, Now I don't really think there's anything that Donald Trump or Boris Johnson 
you could put there's nothing you could put in their mouths that would be more ridiculous than what they're saying already so how do you satirize people who are sort of light entertainment performers already that's what got them elected um so it's a much harder job to prick that pomposity when it's already a sort of um comic persona that's been you know in that is in office so do you think that's happened by accident or is that do you think by design the trumps and the johnsons have worked out that if they go beyond satire they're essentially safer i don't think they're thinking about satire i think they're thinking about character and uh brand uh you know donald trump was his public persona was invented on the apprentice in america he was he pretended to be a top businessman when he'd never been a particularly successful businessman he sort of you know managed the far, the fortune he inherited and managed to sort of not lose all of it and yet there was this fiction on this uh, show that was you know very popular across america that he was this top hard-hitting businessman and the people sort of went that might be good running the country that would be good and the same boris johnson the same he pretends to be a bubbling sort of jovial sort of uh, uh, buffoon and sells it as a brand. And it's a, it is a breath of fresh air, you know, to some people uh, as a contrast for the boring, uh, you know, cautious, suited businessman that we've had, you know, um, trying to get our votes most of the other decades we've been alive. So do you think that now in order to get the top office in the land and here in America and maybe in other countries, it's now created a precedent whereby you have to be humorous. You have to be perceived as somebody who is charismatic and humorous. I think humour is a very valuable asset for anyone in politics or business or in anything. And to have a good joke at the top of a speech gets the audience on your side and it relaxes them. I don't think that Keir Starmer needs to be comic any more than Gordon Brown needed to be comic or, you know, Theresa May. Sometimes the... Uh, the politician elected is a reaction to the last one and it might be that people have had enough of the clown in Downing Street and want a sort of proper grown-up and that's my hope with the leader of the opposition at the moment the most successful politicians do know how to uh, woo a crowd and that includes being funny Obama was funny Tony Blair yeah. could tell a joke um, and uh, you know to be uh, capable of uh, engaging an audience, you know, a, a good sense of humour is something that should be in your armoury. That said, Mrs Thatcher had a terrible sense of humour, could never tell a joke, and uh, it never did her any harm. Well, yeah, it's interesting because uh, we had uh, William Hague on the podcast and he said definitively she had no sense of humour. Yes, and, well, it's interesting. Uh, he, he's, he's actually a rare thing, uh, a, a Tory politician who has a good sense of humour and knows how to tell a joke. He had some good lines against Blair, I remember. And, uh, you know, at a different time, he might have been a more effective politician, but it was not the uh, it was not the moment to be the leader of the Conservative Party. But, yeah, he, he could tell a, the odd gag, I think. Well, I'm interested in the speeches because a lot of our listeners are in business and, you know, the, mm. the whole premise of the Humorology podcast is uh, how it, it can humour can improve business success and life. So in terms of speeches and putting jokes in, because I, as a, as a psychologist, I'm brought in to um, tell them how to tell the, the, the jokes and how to yeah. do, the, do the speeches. And I'm more inclined with people who don't know how to do it to take them out. Yes, so well, that's the, there's nothing worse than a bad joke that falls flat. Of course, it makes you look, you know. So, so I mean, the my, my advice would be, you know, punch, punch up, not down. Don't you know? Make jokes about yourself or about the boss that they're all exasperated by or whatever. Don't put down some poor secretary who's sitting in the front row or just going up to get a drink, you know. Um, and uh, self-awareness and tone are the key things, I would say. You know, if you're going to be doing a joke uh, at, a, at, a, at a serious event, getting the tone right and getting the subject matter right is important. If you're going to get it wrong, better not to do it at all. What, when, when you talk about self-awareness, because, I mean, I think our audience will be interested in what they can take away. How... how would you 
describe that to people is like, no, I want to do, you know, people will have come to you and go, I need a funny line yes. to get me started. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> and yes. I, I, this, well, have you got any, uh, you know, well, Gordon Brown, I remember once saying to me, hi, John, I'm just about to do the Scottish trade union conference. You got any good Scottish trade union jokes lying around? It's like, yeah, Gordon, I've got a whole file of unused Scottish <laughs> trade union jokes right here. <laughs> Let me read them all out to you. So the idea that you've got some jokes spare, you know, you always have to create the jokes. I say to a carpenter, have you got any spare shelves you could put up in my cornice? It's like, it doesn't work like that. You've got to make the shelves and make them fit and, sand them down all that so it's work and it's um everything has to be bespoke um and you know getting it just right for that event is the key well, well it's interesting because i i mean i'm sure all of us have had experience of getting the tone wrong i mean i remember uh, hosting many many years ago uh, a conference for vets and I did the uh, the thing that usually works is I, I took the piss out of the CEO. Right. And it's normally the thing that brings the crowd together. And I just judged it wrong. Wow. And he hated it. Wow. And everybody in the room looked to see if he was laughing. Wow. <laughs> and they didn't feel able to laugh or? And they didn't feel able to laugh. So wow. he obviously had that kind of hold on his whole thing. So yes. I'm wondering if you've had instances when it's gone wrong like that. When I, it's... Well, I did used to do paid after dinner speaking, which I didn't never enjoyed very much, but it used to pay a fortune. So it was like, you know, uh, it was you know, months and months of a salary for one night's speech which was the sort of stock speech that i had in my back pocket so but i always felt a bit cheap doing it somehow um and sometimes it was great if i did it for sort of a public servants if i did it in the public sector like the health service or you know uh, transport organization they seemed to like me but when i did some business in the city they were sort of I could tell they didn't really know who I was and they'd rather have had sort of Roy McGrath or something. And, uh, you know, they were hoping for Clarkson, to be honest. And um, <laughs> so that 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 never felt great. There's, there's times when I remember doing once, which was for a load of diamond traders. I thought, why have I been asked to do this diamond traders event? And they, they just must have just been, I must have just been available. But they were all Belgian Hasidic Jews Who's English must have been their third language, I reckon. Give, give, presuming that they probably spoke, um, you know, Hebrew, uh, either French or Flemish, Flemish probably, and then English. And I was there doing my jokes about being left wing and middle class and writing for Spitting Image and the Labour Party. And they just sat there and smiled so sweetly at me the entire evening. Then they all gave me their business card. And I thought, well, that's 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 better than heckles and being gonged off. <laughs> but, but I just had them nod for half an hour whilst I gave my funny speech. Uh, and it, you know, it was completely the wrong audience. So that's, you know, and then I could do the same speech to, you know, a regional Labour Party and they were bloody fall out laughing and love me for it. So... You know, it's just horses for courses, isn't it? So, John, what makes you laugh? I always watch uh, Would I Lie to You? I often watch um, Have I Got News for You? I love um, I love old sitcoms. I love Billy Wilder movies. I love uh, stand-up. My daughter has started doing stand-up now, so I'm enjoying watching her stuff about, you know, from a young feminist perspective. She's in her mid-20s, so that's, you know, very eye-opening and fresh. Um, I like funny books, from Bill Bryson to Jonathan Coe to, you know, um, Catelyn Moran. Um, I love Joe Brand. I love uh, Eddie Izzard. You know, I watch all of them. And um, it's all... Uh, the great thing is I can put it down as, you know, work. <laughs> Watching comedy, it's like, oh, it's research, you know, I'm I'm watching the yeah. Masters and that informs what I do. That's my excuse for watching comedy so much. Well, it's interesting from a psychological perspective, you're saying it informs what you do. And, and the thing, uh, how much do you think is osmosis and how much is actually looking at what somebody's doing, whether it's a, a rhythm thing, a timing thing or... or the way it's constructed yeah um, i think there's a, i think some is just pleasure you know if i sit there and watch lee mack on a, on, on what i like to i'm just laughing at how funny he is or david mitchell um but with um because i'm not i don't write stand up or i don't you know have an outlet for those sorts of jokes at the moment if i'm sitting down to read Catelyn moran's 
book, I'll go, oh, that's really interesting. How she th- I'll look at the balance between information and uh, comedy you know, and jokes. I'll look at the, uh, if I go and see a funny musical, I'll look at the structure of it and how they use comedy in there and, you know, what sort of tone they've gone for. And I, even if I'm not sort of going away and writing it up afterwards, I, it stays with me and I'll, and I'll talk to directors or whatever, or editors and go, did you ever see such and such a show? I, I was thinking something more like that. So, you know, it's useful to have, to, to, to be, you know, uh, um, absorbing stuff all the time. So uh, when you're around comedy, I, I think it improves everything. So I, I'm just thinking for our audience to, you know, take away is the fact that somebody who is so embroiled in, in comedy is still inhaling it whenever they can and sort of, you know... It, yeah, I mean, I inhale, I inhale serious stuff as well. I mean, I love watching films and dramas and all of that informs me, really, and I read a lot of books. Um, there was a great, um, I, you know, I don't know when this is going out, but we lost uh, the dear Barry Cryer. We lost Barry Cryer last yes, week. Very recently, uh, dear very Barry, sad. and I knew him from writer's rooms of old. But there's a great clip of him on Pointless, there, standing there beside Omid Jalili, and... Uh, uh, Sandra Armstrong said to him, well, when was the golden age of comedy? And Barry Cry gave the best answer you could give, which is now. now I'm not going to talk about the olden days being better than today. Uh, we're living in the golden age of comedy. There's all so much talent around. There are so many brilliant new comics coming up, and it's a pleasure to still be doing it after all these decades. And that's sort of the, the answer I aspire to give in my 80s, that to, to stay relevant, to stay interested, and to keep learning from people younger and, and fresher than you. Well, is is that what drove you to uh, do the musicals in on Broadway? Because uh, it, it seems like quite a leap, having gone from television to books to uh, then suddenly you're doing hit musicals on Broadway. It does sound rather grand, doesn't it? It sort of didn't happen like that, really. I didn't go, now I'd like to do a musical. Yes, I shall have success with that. I mean, what <laughs> happened was um, I... Uh, I mean, it is true that I do like to try new things. So, you know, I, I voluntarily gave up being one of, one of the lead writers on Spitting Image um, after 10 series. I could have, we could have carried on, but we all felt we'd been there long enough and uh, it was time to do something else. Then I went on to be one of the first um, writers on uh, Have I Got News For You? And that was a fresh new show and felt an exciting thing to do. When I came to write books, that wasn't a long-term plan. It's just that the first book idea I had was um, a success and I enjoyed the experience. And so I wrote more books. And then after 10 years of writing books and someone said, would you like to go write a musical with me? I sort of thought, well, that sounds interesting. And I didn't think we'd get it on Broadway. I didn't think it would happen, but I was prepared to give it a go. But the lights kept turning green and rival shows kept falling away and producers kept saying yes. And it happened and it ran for two years. So suddenly I'm a Broadway musical book writer. <laughs> this isn't a part of a planned strategy. Um the only thing I would say about that is just be prepared to try stuff out and experiment. There's lots of things I've tried that have failed, you know, um, and these you're remembering the ones that have been a success. And the other thing I'd say is be someone people want to work with. So don't be an idiot. Don't be a dick. Don't be difficult. Be prepared to do your rewrites uh, and work hard and hit your deadlines. Uh, and then maybe you'll be asked back a second time or people who've done one project with you might ask to do another. I think this is a, something that recurs um, from the humorology project, is that in order to create an atmosphere where whereby humour can flow, hmm. you have to be of good humour, don't yeah. you? Yeah, well, it does vary, actually. I hear, I'm not going to name any names, but there are very famous people in this industry uh, who are quite difficult to work with and because they're stars they get away with it but it won't always be like that and one day they'll be slightly out of fashion and the producers will go i'm not doing anything else with him he's a pain in the ass and um uh it seems to be uh foolish to not be someone who's pleasant to be in a studio with um one of the ensemble said to me when i was in uh new york in the autumn said you should never do a musical 
with anyone you wouldn't go camping with. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> you know, because you're in the trenches and you're working long hours and everyone's having to sort of make sacrifices and lose songs or have their lines cut or be asked to do this, do something different again and again and again. And you have to have such patience and trust in one another that, uh, you know, you really need to be, uh, put your ego to one side and do what's best for the show. And that's that applies right across the board, I think. I, yeah, it's it comes down to being decent, to being nice, to be because uh, I think hu- that, and having humility, I would say, is the other one. So the other the other well, thing I'd say about being a writer, you need an enormous ego. We talked about ego at the beginning. There's an enormous ego of me to go. I've written a book. Here's eighty thousand words, everyone. I think you should read it. That's a very arrogant thing to do. But to make the book any good at all, you've got to also have enormous humility to say to yourself, "It's not good enough yet. I can make it better." I need to rewrite it again and again and again until I feel, think it's really the best it can be. If you don't have that, then you've got, you know, there's, and there's plenty of people out there who <laughs> will give, out, give in their first or second draft. But, you know, you've got to have that balance of ego and humility, I think, to really uh, push yourself but the best that you can be out there. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That humility and that being nice, nice to be around as well. I, yeah. I think I think it was Larry Gelbart who said something like, "To write comedy is to report on life viewed through a special lens." Yes, I think that's you know that comment. Yeah, uh, it is. That's what I've got. I've got a lens, you know, and because uh, I'm not going to sit here and go, "Oh, I don't think I'm very funny." Clearly, I've been writing comedy for 35 years. I know how to write a joke. I'm not the very best in the business, but I've made a living at it for 35 years. So I'm able to, you know, you know, and have I got news for you to turn around and say, write 12 jokes about Winnie Mandela. I could do that. And that's not something that everyone can sit down and do. Um, As I say, I can't paint a picture. I couldn't run for political office. I couldn't win as a politician. I wouldn't be a success as a politician. I've tried other things and they find them very hard. But um, uh, just to have a skill and to be able to uh, uh, thrive doing it, I I am going to say that lovely thing of I've been very lucky. I feel incredibly lucky to have made a living at the thing I really enjoyed doing. And it's been um, uh, it's been quite a ride to have all these different outlets, you know, in which to work. Is everyone funny, John? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's weird. It's weird. So Lots so of all the things that people won't admit to. So people will say, oh, I'm rubbish with money or I'm no good at maths or I'm rubbish at sport. But no one thinks they've got a bad sense of humour. No one ever. You know, Mrs. Thatcher would never go. You've, if you said to Mrs. Thatcher, you've got a terrible sense of humour. Um, she would never have gone. No, you're right. That's one thing. I, you know, I'm a you know, good, politi- effective politician, but uh, comedy, forget it. She would think, oh, I like a good, I like humour. I'd like Arthur Askey or whatever she was into. <laughs> uh, but um, um, so it's not something that people are prepared to admit, but uh, it's definitely uh, it's definitely the case that not everyone is funny or able to enjoy comedy or has just has that, you know, that bone in their body that, that, that appreciates or enjoys comedy or think it's appropriate. Yeah. So do you think that you could actually teach people or you can teach people to be better, surely. But do you think there's actually a level whereby they haven't got a funny bone so that they're, they're, it's impossible now? Uh, well, you probably could make anyone a bit funnier or make them a bit more open to how comedy works. But, you know, I'm trying to think of some other people who I think are desperately unfunny. Uh, I think some people are just so... Uh, earnest and pompous and uh, self-regarding and severe that I cannot imagine, you know, ever getting, uh, uh, sharing, a, sharing a joke with them. It's, just it's like, interesting you know, though, isn't it? That everybody on their dating profile puts good sense of humour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, exactly. And everyone, and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of deal breaker, isn't it really? For most yeah. people, if you've got no sense of humour. And um it's ridiculous, really, that how much stead we put on it in our society, that to be funny just makes you likeable. And it's so much less important than being trustworthy. I mean, take Boris Johnson. You know, he is was quite funny on Have I Got News For You. And he, I have been on panel shows with him and he's been quite funny. And I'm thinking that's what's got him so far. You know, he's just sort of this plays this comedy buffoon. And it's terrible that we 
we fought how, for it. We fought for that, and we value that above integrity, competence. You know, it's not. We're not. We're not asking. You're not appointing a. You know head of a panel show here we're asking someone to be prime minister and yet the comedy is seems to count more than the sort of stern uh sort of competence of someone like gordon brown or Theresa may which 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 just doesn't go last very long well it, it is extraordinary isn't it and and yeah. i think that's why i asked the question earlier of uh, have we now reached the stage where it has to be that or is the world going to turn back because we've gone too far and go actually what we need is a gray man or a safe pair of hands somebody to because you're very politically active yes. so I, I i this must frustrate you mustn't it <laughs> Well, the, the, it drives me crazy. I mean, there's, I feel slightly invo- slightly responsible as someone who's working on Have I Got News For You when Boris Johnson was uh, sort of turned into a celebrity. You know, without those shows, I don't think he would have become mayor of London. And I don't think he would have become you know, prime minister. So the comedy industry sort of uh, has some responsibility for uh, our current uh, situation. Uh, but wasn't hope... it the case? Sorry, I, 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 right. I'm just going to pick up on that. But but wasn't it the case? Because I've talked to both Paul and Ian about this. Um, wasn't it the case that actually at the time you all thought you'd ruined his career? Well, in in a sense that he made a buffoon of himself. I just I just think that being able to seem to be uh, up for a joke. Did him no harm at all. So yes, he was. He seemed damaged when he was, you know, uh, some of the bad things he'd done was exposed. But you think about Neil and Christine Hamilton. Uh, they came on the show. Paul and Ian, well, Ian particularly, just kept going at them for the things they had done and pointing out the terrible, corrupt things that they'd done. And they just kept chuckling as if it was a joke. And everyone went, "Oh, they seem to sort of take it on the chin." And they sort of, it sort of got them off the hook in a weird sort of way. Um, you know, it's not like a skewering by sort of uh, Paxman or you know John Humphreys or something. If, to, to be over there with a panel show, laughing and clapping, sort of gives them permission to be the characters they are. Well, that's very interesting in the sense that that. Uh... Now, um, politicians are avoiding the big sort of news night type yeah. pieces and going for the easy light entertainment yeah. model. So that must be a deliberate ploy, must it not? To, to think, well, actually, people are just going to see where, in inverted commas, pleasant. And yeah, so I, that's... Yeah, I mean, Je- this is not new. Je- Thatcher preferred going on the Jimmy Young show than, than going in front of Robin Day. You know, that's okay. uh, uh, though he was quite respectful. I mean, there's something I'll say about else I'll say about all of this is that we have this grand idea that satire is this b- brilliant political weapon that can skewer a politician or uh, you know bring down a government. Uh, I think it's quite possible that the opposite is true. That uh, a really good satirical joke that you've all shared sort of processes the anger that you had and now you're laughing at the politician instead of being furious with them and somehow it's sort of processed dealt with and we can move on to the next thing and you feel a sort of smug superiority for laughing down at them and somehow the politicians got away with it and can move on to the next thing so sometimes i think that satire does the opposite of what the satirists intend and it sort of helps the politicians you know, uh, and in countries like a, a sort of Iran or Indonesia, where there is no, you're not allowed to be funny. I just think the anger continues to boil up because there's no outlet for what you want to say. That's really interesting from a psychological perspective, because you've really made me think and I'm, I'm going, well, actually, the joke has pro- induced a state change. Yes. So therefore, we now no longer have the anger, like you yes. say. Yeah, it's been it's it's been sort of uh, uh, it's been converted by so like some sort of enzyme has sort of converted anger into contempt, uh, mocking contempt, and there we are. It's the, the situation has been processed, and uh, I no longer feel like I want to sort of uh, uh, storm the Bastille or whatever. Uh, you know, well, uh, that's really interesting. So maybe memes are not helping. Maybe memes are just sort of deflecting. Well, I do feel this with Twitter. I feel that Twitter and and, and, and social media is that we're all going, oh, look how unpopular the government is on Twitter. And then you will see another Tory landslide. It's like, guys, yes. get out there, talk to people, change people's minds. And... Um, uh, engage with people who are not on Twitter because you get onto this little bubble and you think, oh, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm, look how many likes 
that joke got. So I'm so I'm, things are really changing. And it's like, no, no, you're, you're still talking to a tiny minority of people and uh, you're not engaging with the mass of voters who are not that interested in politics, actually. We'll just go out once every five years and probably vote for the status quo. Yeah, that's what really sort of bothers me. That Can comedy change things? I mean, because we had Rick Wilson from the Lincoln Project on the podcast and there there was kind of a feeling that the Lincoln Project did have an effect on Trump um, because he hated being mocked. Yeah. And I wondered if, if, I wondered if you think there's really a way through. I mean, led by donkeys do it in this country. Yeah, yeah I think uh, that's... What- I think sometimes a good joke can crystallize a feeling. I think sometimes, and it can, and it can help, uh, it can help uh, damage an individual politician. So the famous example going right back is Henry Brook, and that was the week that was. Uh, or there's, um, you know, the way that David Steele was portrayed uh, in Spitting Image alongside David Owen, and I think that probably did do some personal damage to that particular politician. But. Um, in terms of bringing down governments, I think, you know, governments lose elections. Satirists don't win them. I think it's a fairly safe rule. Well, it's, I, I was just thinking about the David Owen, David Steele. Were, yeah. were you responsible for that uh, that gag? No. Which was too, uh, we're going to use your, part of your name and part right. of my name. <laughs> no, that's just before I came on the show. But I remember the one you're talking about. Uh, but I, I'll tell you a little bit that I think is interesting about that is that uh, David Steele's uh, continual portrayal as the junior partner in that double act, I think, propelled him to try and reunite to to to, to unite the the SDP Liberal Alliance quicker than David Owen was willing to go. Led to a split. Led to them standing against each other at the Richmond by election. Uh, and they would have the Alliance would have won that election if they'd not stood against each other. And then William Hague won that, became an MP, became leader of the Tory party. And so he owes his entrance to Parliament to, I think, Splitting Image. This is my radical uh, uh, pitch for uh, the butterfly effect, that um, that that little gag on um, uh, Splitting Image so incensed David Steele that it led to Hague winning the by-election that made him get, make it to Parliament. Take it wow. with a pinch of salt, but I'm standing by it. <laughs> well, I'm going to clip this and send it to, uh, to William Hague and see uh, yes. see how he feels about that. I wrote about it in the New Statesman, so he might have encountered it before, but we'll see. What oh, it no, but, it, uh, but yeah. you see, humour can, can have yeah. radical effects, but I'm really interested that it can be not the effect you want. Yeah, I think sometimes you never know. So, for example, I did a spitting image sketch when Maggie was um, uh, about to lose the... Uh, uh, leadership of the Tory party and it was the they were, it was, they'd had the it was coming out to the first vote and I did a scene of her just walking around an empty house of commons and shadows with echoes of her former speeches you know this lady's not for turning no 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 and then she was just sobbing quietly in the corner and it went to the end of the show and it was just like final central tv logo and I thought well, that's that's put her in her place Ha. And uh, two Tory MPs, it was reported to be by somebody inside Westminster, two Tory MPs were so moved by that that they changed from uh, voting against her to abstaining. And that those two would have been enough to get over the line at the first vote. So it's, it says me trying to get Mrs Thatcher out of Westminster. I was helping her stay in for a little bit longer. And she ended up going anyway, as it turned out. But so you never know what the impact of your joke is going to be or whether it'll uh, be received in the manner that you uh, you deliver it. Um, you know, because everyone, it's always subjective and people have their own reactions. That's that's <laughs> fascinating. But so do you think what part in bringing down a, a, a Boris Johnson government do you think humour can effectively do? Or do you think it's we're now just in the hands of reality? No, I think uh, a good joke can, I mean, you talk about the led by donkeys thing. I think that thing of equating him, you know, with a suspect in a really popular crime drama is a very clever way of uh, crystallizing how we're all feeling about him. When, uh, um, who was it? When uh, Boris Johnson said to Keir Starmer, You're a lawyer, not a leader, 
uh, one of the uh, one of the Labour front bench, I think it was Alice McGovern, said, "Yeah, I wouldn't knock uh, lawyers, Boris. You might be needing one soon." <laughs> but well, but these, this is a if you can get a joke that goes, you know, make a you can make your own side feel sort of uh, slightly sort of uh, comforted and uh, uh, feel better about themselves. But also it can cut through to people who are not really concentrating and a good joke might make them go, no, oh, that's that's funny. And you, they don't know why they're laughing, but they don't realise some of all the other stuff they picked up along the way. And it you know, helps them pick sides, I think. Yeah, well, and it also somebody would also thought, OK, um, lawyer, not a leader, good alliteration. Yeah. But immediately I saw on Twitter everybody, I'd rather have a lawyer, not a liar. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. you know, backfired in that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the other the other f- famous example is the um, Donald Trump being roasted by Obama. So Obama was president. He sat there. He had a, his dinner. Trump was in the room and Obama just ripped the piss out of Donald Trump sitting at I table 27. It. And I wonder if in that moment, Trump went, I am going to st- I am going to show that guy. And he became, you know, set upon uh, becoming the guy who would end up replacing Obama. I wonder if that, if, if he hadn't had that roasting from the president in such a public forum, maybe he wouldn't have um, become so determined to be a politician. Unintended consequences. Yeah. I, I'm really interested in that uh, that particular moment because it goes back to something you said about, it sounds strange, but would that be perceived as punching down? from the uh, stage i think it didn't if you're talking about a millionaire property dealer maybe i, I think he's punching across you know he's a, a uh i mean the it's hard for the president of the united states to punch up frankly uh, he's got to do jokes <laughs> yes. about god um so again i think it's pick your targets and um you know a, um a very arrogant uh rich white man is an f- acceptable target for a witty black president. The, 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 the other thing, I mean, talk about that arrogance thing. I remember in the Blair years, there was a fashion for punching down. There was um, a lot of funny comedy on British TV, but most of it was fairly posh people or fairly comfortable people like um, the Little Britain guys doing jokes about... Um, you know, uh, people on council estates. Vicky you know, Pollard. Vic, Vic, Vicky Pollard or the bloke in the wheelchair. There was, uh, um, you know, Harry Enfield doing the slobs. There was um, uh, Catherine Tate doing Am I Bothered? But the way they got away with it was to make their targets arrogant. So you think, oh, they're, they're due for a, they're due for a, uh, uh, being taken down a strip or two. Never mind that the people doing them, like, you know, um, as much as I love them, Matt Lucas and David Williams, and I think they're very funny, they're quite privileged guys to be taking the piss out of Vicky Pollard. Um, and uh, they got away with it by making her really arrogant and needing to be taken down a peg or two, which I think is the sort of the, the, the clever bit of it. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I, because he was quite entitled to, to go for him. I just, because for me, the word was perception, because if you're yeah. talking about middle of America, yeah. mid America, were they perceiving that the president was punching down to, because uh, half of um, the shtick that um, Trump did was about getting rid of the elites. Right, right, right. And so did uh, it yeah. play into that? Yeah, mode? yeah. Well, maybe that's what he was talking about. He was talking about those Washington types, you know, the, the career politicians. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that uh, middle America watched the correspondence dinner or whatever it was that uh, Obama did. But, yeah, Trump, yeah. Trump made himself a victim. He made... Uh, sort of uh, white America, sort of Rust Belt America, feel like a victim for the, from the liberals. And that's a, a key bit of sort of uh, uh, positioning. It's probably not that connected with comedy, but it's to do with psychology, which you're also very interested in. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. It, if I asked you to write a business case for humour, John, what would you include? A business case for humour? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Do you mean... Well, uh, I mean, like... Humor... Why, why should, should we, I, why should we have humor in our company what what 
what's going to be better? Why should we allow it in? What's what's the advantage, really? I suppose if your company is a sort of, uh, you know, uh, an organisation where people have to rub along with each other and uh, go through difficult periods together, then uh, humour, like team building, like uh, um, listening to each other and, and, and everyone sort of learning to work with each other, humour is a key part of that. Um, people want to enjoy their work. They want to like their fellow workers and jokes are just a very uh everyday way in which we share our uh experiences storytelling is essential to the human experience and funny stories that happen to us is the first thing we want to tell our friends when we get into the the, the tea room in the morning stand around the water cooler as the americans would say yeah. Um, yeah so sharing what makes us laugh is a bonding thing and i think if you're talking about um uh business business thrives on cooperation on people all pulling together uh that's a great you know corporate glue that you can find if you can all you know share a sense of humor and find a way of um uh putting aside your differences with a, a good joke and and having a good laugh and at the people over there who are your competitors <laughs> so it might be a good way of uh of, of bonding your team no, I, I love the idea of corporate glue because, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what humour does. And also, if you're enjoying going to work, surely mm -hmm. that's, you know, already you're winning because you're looking forward to to going to, you know, you've worked in lots of um, stressful atmospheres, whether that's the theatre with Mrs. Yeah. Doubtfire or, you right. know, having to get, have I got news out um, yeah, and like something. Yeah. Uh, but if you shout at somebody uh, at that, does it help them to get more creative quickly? No, probably Answer, not. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I remember the, uh, and it just... Uh, it just unites you as an organization, I think, to share a joke. So I remember the, you know, if I do jokes at Labour Party conference or at Labour, if I'm, if I get a good observation about the opposition or about ourselves, everyone loves that. If I, if, if I do, I mean, somebody said that the, at the uh, Labour Party conference, there's all, at the Tory Party conference, there's always a comedy review taking the mickey out of the Labour Party. And the Labour Party conference, there's always a comedy review taking the mickey out of the Labour Party <laughs> because, because we, like to we, we, we enjoy mocking ourselves more than the opposition but I mean that's partially true but when I do jokes about what it's like to go to boring meetings you know and sit there and have the one pedant sort of saying point of order Madam Chairman people laugh and go oh I've been there mate yeah I know we've got one of those in our ward or in our constituency people love that and it makes them feel part of something and it makes them feel uh, like they belong and I think it's part of it helps with identity and sort of self-worth uh, when you all feel like you're sharing that experience together. We've reached a part of the show, John, which we like to call quick fire questions. OK. Quick fire questions. Who's the funniest business person that you've met? I suppose this is a bit of a cheating answer, but Jimmy Mulville is a businessman now, I suppose, because he runs Hattrick Productions and always has done. But he started out as a performer and writer, and I suppose he's carried that across into his uh, his work running Hattrick. So he's someone that's very good fun to be in the company of. He's very funny and very quick and witty, but he's actually running this you know major television production company uh, responsible for so many of the comedy shows in our uh, uh in our lifetimes so yeah jimmy marvel will be right up there um but then maybe i'm cheating because he's probably no, comedy no. first business second no no I, I don't think jimmy is very very funny what book makes you laugh i will say i was on a radio four program and they said what's the funniest book ever written and they one of them said well i think nicholas nickleby and somebody else said something else like finnegan's wake or something and i just read frank 
Skinner's uh, memoir. And I just said, that is, Frank Skinner's memoir is so much funnier than those. And because yes. it's by this sort of working class comic, you're sort of don't, not even counting it, but it's hilarious. And his account of losing his virginity is the funniest and the grimmest thing you'll ever read. Um, yes. So I would put that up there. It's one of the funniest books I've ever read. What film makes you laugh? Uh, I grew up loving Monty Python and the Holy Grail and oh, Alfred yeah. Brown and things like that. Now, then I, um, and I loved all the sort of um, police squads type stuff, uh, things like uh, Groundhog Day. Still love Billy Wilder. Um, and we'll watch those again and again. Well, taking a quick shift to the other side, um, what's not funny? Certain things you just don't do jokes about. You know, and when I was writing topical uh, comedy, uh, there'd be a story and you'd go, I just think this is, do not enter, this This subject is too grim or too recent uh, to do comedy about. And when I worked on Weekending, they used to have this bloke we'd ring up who'd do a poem about the IRA bomb going off at Ennis Killing, or you'd have it about a, uh, uh, a horrific, you know, thing about some animal torture thing that had been uncovered vivisection or something people aren't going to laugh at a load of animals being tortured in a lap you know so don't go there don't do a joke about it i would include recent murders um uh rape is not funny uh violence against a uh uh pretty well anyone is not funny I, I as i got older i've got more and more sort of like not wanting to do jokes about any sort of violence particularly with the way that sort of you know politicians have started to become victims of violence themselves so there are things that i just think no steer clear of that it's not worth it uh, i don't do tweets about them you know i don't do tweets even joking about wanting to slap boris johnson because i don't, don't even want to think you want to cross that line of talking about physical violence what word makes you laugh when i was a when i was a little boy the word gherkin used to make me burst out in hysterics <laughs> and i learned <laughs> And I learned that, you know, I suppose then that I learned that the K word, it just has a sort of um, a resonance, you know, that all those Anglo-Saxon swear words all end with K, and that's very helpful. Um, there are, you do learn that there are words to put on the end of a sentence, which are, you know, uh, just naturally funny. And the opposite applies. So that when I would, you know, so you, you know, for some reason, it's funny to say, Yes, he's a he, uh, he was uh, I've been he was a sales rep from Kettering. It's more interesting than he was a sales rep from Islington, for example. So there are certain place names that are funny. There are the, the M25 used to get a laugh just saying the motorway used to get a laugh. Um, but the opposite applies. I remember when I was writing for Clive Anderson on his show, he used to write his monologue, and there was a story about an ex, I think it was a nuclear test that the French were doing at Murora Murora Atoll. And there's no way you can put the word murora in a punchline. You just can't say it even. It's got so many vowels. But and I tried to write this punchline that was, yes, well, I'll tell that to the French at murora. It's like, no, it's not going to happen, John. You can't do it. So, you know, if they'd been doing it at the Balearics, tell that to the French at the Balearics. You know, yeah. That would have been great. It sounds funny. So it's a weird science. But, you know, changing the changing the place name, changing the surname of a character, these things can all affect the 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 balance and the um, uh, the impact uh, of the of a joke just from constants and vowels and the balance of them. It's a and weird it was, science. Wasn't it Neil Simon who originally came? Wasn't it in the Sunshine Boys? Was it the Kays of Funny? Kays of Funny, Poughkeepsie. Yeah. He's stuck in Poughkeepsie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Kays are funny. It's just fascinating, isn't it? And maybe 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 every language has its own rules like that. But yeah. Yeah. Um well, Polish there, there a, should all be funny then, shouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a bloke I knew who used to write the gags for uh, Noel Edmonds. And uh, uh, he, some family were coming on as contestants on his show. And they said, uh, he said to them before the show, what is it you do? And he goes, I do all the signage on the uh, and the streets, furniture and things like the, 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 the traffic bollards. And he went, oh, great. Just say, when Noel says, what do you do? Just go, bollards. What? And then he can go, I only asked. So they went, right, oh, okay. So just practice. What do you do for a living? Bollards. Great. So live on TV, the bloke said, Noel Edmund says to the bloke, uh, so what do you do for a living? Well, I do all the street furniture and all the signs. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Noel Edmonds is all ready to go, I only asked. I only asked. <laughs> bollards. Bollards is funnier than street furniture. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, always. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Is there a sound that makes you laugh out of interest? 
Uh, I suppose a swanny whistle is funnier than a scream or a baby crying. I think sort of that sort of comedy of the sort of, you know, the Phantom Raspberry Blower I feels a little bit easy for me. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Is there a sound that makes me laugh? There probably is. I can't think of it off the top of my head, Paul. But, um, you know, maybe a, a, a whoopee cushion at a cabinet meeting would get a giggle. I don't know. But uh, so I suppose context is, is, is everything. So inappropriate. Inappropriate. Yeah things is funny i mean I was, so I was on another podcast the other day and somebody said what's the th something that you miss and i went laughing when you're not allowed to laugh and that is oh. that's uh, that's the best thing when you're at, at school and you've got the giggles yes. and it was a really serious teacher the suppressed laughter is the funniest thing in the world and i'm sort of sad i'm never in situations anymore where you get to do that now you 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 um I'm allowed to laugh. I've been working in comedy. I'm supposed to laugh. But that feeling you have on standing on stage on school speech day and you get the giggles, there's no better feeling. Actually, just as an aside, Ainsley and I were invited to World Commonwealth Day at, the, okay. at Westminster Abbey. Yep. And we were placed right opposite the whole of the royal family. The last time the whole of the royal family was <laughs> together. And it was the ultimate laughing in church because we went yeah, to yeah. school together. Uh, yeah. Two comprehensive schoolboys just giggling and our shoulders were going up and oh, down I love it. at That's the ridiculous hilarious. novels. Yeah. Yeah. It's like being oh. back at school. Fantastic. It, yeah. it I was, mean, I was yeah. laughing in church. My, I was at my cousin's uh, christening. My daughter was two years old. And the vicar was giving his long speech and she was lying on the floor in between the pews and just went, yeah, 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 whatever. And just to, just to see all the shoulders going up and down in front of me was, was a joy to behold. I was thinking, I can see from their body language how much laughter is being suppressed in this room. And it's the thing I remember most about that day, of course. Oh, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. What a lovely image. Yeah. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? I suppose funny. I'd, I'd like to be considered both and I try to be both i suppose i don't think i try and be clever but i try and be thoughtful um yeah funny i suppose it's a it's a very shows you how shallow i am it's probably proves that i'm not clever actually that i've given you that answer <laughs> <laughs> and finally john desert island gags you can only take one joke with you to a desert island what is it i think i'd take the wide mouth frog joke because it sort of uh it, it has a bit of performance in it it um it doesn't offend anybody it's uh uh it's got a great uh, uh switch in the uh uh in the reveal and a little bit of funny performance at the end of it so if the if your if your listeners don't know the wide mouth frog joke well maybe they should google it or something i'm not sure i can do it now on live on air uh but uh that's a that's a, a, a an old classic that's been funny throughout my life it's quite visual but it's a perfect gag to take with you to your desert island. John O'Farrell, thank you for being a wonderful guest on the Humorology Podcast. I've enjoyed it, Paul. It's always good fun to talk comedy. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.